or renewals. From the 1900s to the 1962 year period of renewal. I think I must have uh, already taken this up, especially with the first year when we talk about the history of, the, of theology during these reform movements prior to the Second Vatican Council. There were three major movements, reform movements, liturgical renewal, the And the method and the approach that they used was basically to go back to the sources, not to the high middle ages, which was considered by many people, by many romantic uh, theologians during the uh, early 1900s as the golden age of Catholicism. But this time this renewal was going all the way back to the fathers of the church. For them, that would be the ideal, early Christian communities, that would be the ideal, not the what he calls this, the too elaborate, feudalistic, monarchical kind of a uh, model that you find in the high Middle Ages, the gold, so-called golden age of Christianity. But there was also the approach of, of nouvelle theology, new theology. Basically, this is a counter, uh, counter a, a response to neo-scholasticism. Nouvelle theology went back, not just to Thomas Aquinas, but to the fathers of the church and their writings, examined what they actually said. And many of the things that were being used by neo-scholastic theologians were actually quotes from the uh, medieval theologians who were also quoting the fathers of the church. So what Nouvelle theology wanted to do was to go back well, go back to the fathers of the church. And even further back, you go back to the Bible. What does the Bible have to say? Now, of course, this was questionable as far as the institutional church was concerned. Why? Because it's very Protestant. You go back to the Bible, you are like Protestants. So, aha. So anybody who is involved in novel theology, the new theology, would be considered Protestant. Oh, we need to condemn. And that is where what they call Pius the Ninth uh, would Pius the Tenth would condemn modernism in his encyclicals. Uh, but many of the a good number of the ideas condemned as modernist ideas, but Pius the Ninth were actually became eventually were recognized by the Second Vatican Council. And the methodology that they use was basically the historical critical methodology. What, that, what we are doing actually is you know, historical critical methodology. You go back to history and the critique, but put it in its own context. Understand it within its own context. Don't understand it in light of medieval theology or in light of our present day theology. No, you understand it in its own proper context. Then draw from there what you can draw for your own theology today. Okay, That is the way we talk about his, the historical critical methodology. For example, we talk about the liturgical movement. Basically, we talk about two phases. The first phase was the pre-1910 uh, phase, which was usually the phase uh, identified with Solem, the Benedictine monastery of Solem in France, whose leader was Prosper Garanger, the, of course, the Benedictine. He was the one, he probably got fed up with all this uh, polyphonic uh, uh, masses of, uh, of Mozart, of Haydn, of uh, Schubert, etc., and Beethoven. He said, let's go back to the Gregorian chant, which is really the, the music of the high middle ages, Gregorian chant. So he again restored Gregorian chant to its place in the, in the church itself. But Pius X was also part of this first phase in the sense that he was the one who advocated frequent communion and especially communion for children. Uh, this much we can say about Pius the, the tenth. And he was a, he was one who really uh, <clears throat> uh, promoted uh, communion. What it meant, of course, was that uh, the celebration of the Eucharist was not just the action of the priest, but when the people come to communion, they are able to participate also in the celebration. So that's already one minor step towards having the people involved in the in the Eucharist itself, okay? So uh, again, this is where we need to, 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 
to appreciate what Pius X had done. He had opened the way, the door very slightly for the re re-entrance of the lay people into the, the, uh, the Eucharistic celebration, first by communion. Notice that before that, the, pre the people can go to uh, listen to the mass anyway, they are there praying their devotions, etc., and and the rosaries. And after they're finished, then they go home. They don't have to have communion. They don't have to receive communion. Pius IX says, no, you should be you should participate and, and receive communion also. We take it for granted nowadays that when we have to go to mass, you, know, you go to communion. You're that's your part. You, your mass will not be complete if you did not receive communion. But at that time, it was rare, it was very rare. Okay, so Pius X also promoted communion for children, like the first communion, for them to get introduced. It was a way actually of recovering what we call the, uh, the first in, in, initiation, sacraments of initiation, which was basically baptism confirmation and then the first communion, to make people more aware of this. By the way, the, uh, the monastery that you find there is the Solemn. Monastery. But in the second phase of the liturgical movement was Lambert Boudouin, who was the uh, uh, Benedictine monk of the uh, Benedictine monastery in Louvain. In Louvain. Uh, I did a lot of research in, in that monastery. Uh, <clears throat> this, this is the second figure, the, the rightmost uh, uh, figure, that is Lambert Boudouin. His idea was that we need to promote full and active participation of everyone, not just the priest, but everyone, full and active participation. But in 1910, that was heretical, considered heretical by many people. Oh, no, 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 no. They are not ordained. Why should they be fully and actively participating in this? Year? No, 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 no. But slowly, gradually, that was promoted. See, so can, can you imagine from 1910 up to our own time, up to 1965, people are now able to participate. But it was very, very gradual. In the 1950s, when they reformed the Holy Week services and the rituals, they started introducing local language. Before that, everything was in Latin still. All the altar servers had to memorize the responses in Latin. I did that. I memorized all the... Uh, the Latin responses when I was serving as an altar server in, when I was in high school. I did all that to, 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 uh, to memorize all of that. And it was long, long, difficult, but you had to memorize it. If you want to become an altar server, you better memorize them. Okay, then there were also some liturgical congresses that were talking, talking about different aspects of the uh, liturgy and how we can reform them, et cetera, side by side with the reform, of course, of the, in the church. Then, of course, the preparatory liturgical commission for Vatican II, which was basic, which consisted basically of great experts, the experts in, in liturgy. Basically, all of the work that has been done from the 1910 all the way to the 1960s, it was all brought together there in preparation for the reform of the Second Vatican Council. So that was what happened in the liturgical movement. The other movement is the biblical movement. Pius XII issued a letter in 1943, Divina Flantis Spiritu, which basically allowed people to not only read the Bible more frequently, but especially for the biblical scholars to examine the Bible from a more or less scientific methodology. Why? The Protestants were already doing it. The Protestants were way, way ahead of biblical scholarship. They were doing it. They were going back to the sources of the, the Bible. They were already translating it from the original, not from the Latin. During that time, uh, the text of the Bible that was used by the church was always the Latin Vulgate, which was a translation of the Greek Bible, the Septuagint. <clears throat> so... Uh, <clears throat> uh, but the Protestants were already going back to the Greek, uh, original Greek uh, New Testament. And so they already had kind of a biblical ex a scholarship that, uh, <clears throat> that was making them reinterpret many of the things that, that they find in the scriptures. In 1943, 
in a way, Pius XII opened the gate for the biblical scholars, Catholic biblical scholars. That's when we started to, to what do you call this, to have the Pontifical Biblical Commission that would more or less regulate on how biblical texts. Eventually, of course, Catholic biblical scholars caught up with the Protestants. We were, I think nowadays we can say we're almost on the same level. But Bible translation into different local languages became more and more like something. But this is very Protestant. Martin Luther translated the Bible into German. That was in the 1500s. <laughs> now it's 1900s, and where the Catholic Church just beginning to translate into the local language. Okay. The third movement, however, was also very important, which is the ecumenical movement. At the turn of the century, in the late 1800s, there was already kind of a movement. Cardinal Newman was among these people, by the way, who were involved in the ecumenical movement. The first phase also of the ecumenical movement was the whole idea was for the Protestants to return, to return to the, to, to the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, after 200, 300 years, that is almost, you know, a vain wish. You cannot, you cannot, that cannot happen. Of course, the whole idea of uh, the polemic against outside of the church, against the Protestants, when the, when the church uh, mentioned outside of the church, there is no salvation. Uh, that's, that basically says, uh, if you are not inside the church, by, by, the, by the way, the church was interpreted as Roman Catholic Church. If you are not within the Roman Catholic Church, then there is no salvation for you. But you have the Protestants going back to the Bible and say, you know, the Protestant, the salvation is for all. It's a gift from God. It's not only contained in the Roman Catholic Church, it's contained. It's, it's the will of God. Okay. And then there were also studies on the Orthodox and the Reformers' theologies and practices. Oxford Movement, as I said, uh, Cardinal Newman was among the promoters of the Oxford Movement. Eventually, of course, Cardinal Newman became a Catholic. But uh, the Oxford Movement was, uh, was uh, instrumental in the, in the, the dialogue with the Anglicans, with the Anglicans. And eventually, of course, the founding of the World Council of Churches in the 1930s, in 37 and 38. The Roman Catholic Church is not a member of the World Council of Churches. Because the church always says, we are not just one of the churches in the World Council of Churches. We are the Roman Catholic Church. So until now, it is not a member. But there is a line of communication that is made open between the World Council of Churches and the Roman Catholic Church, especially now with the pontificate of uh, Francis. Implications of this? Well, we need to reframe theology of the sacraments, of course, theology of the church, and of course, eventually theology of ministry. But in between, we need to reframe how we are able to study Bible, how we're able to make use of scientific methods in talking about a, renew, a new way of talking about the sacraments. And when we talk about the church, we're not just talking about the church from within or, or just within an intra, looking inward looking kind of a perspective, but also what is the church, what's the message of the church to the people outside of the church, to the world at large? So it's very important. You need to, these are very serious implications that were drawn from the renewal movement. Now we go to the Church of Vatican II, but I'm, what I'm going to do simply here is talk about three of the constitutions that would give us an idea of what kind of church does Vatican II have. The second year I've finished ecclesiology already, no? You had ecclesiology with uh, Father uh, Rowan, right? Yes, yes. Yes, brother. All right, so you, you are familiar with this, but I'm just going to go through this for the sake of the first year who have not taken up the ecclesiology. Unless, the first year I've taken up ecclesiology also? 
No. Father. You did that because you had to have a fundamental theology before taking English theology. Okay. But just do two different uh, views. I I'm sorry I cannot I cannot show you in the in the second in the the, the picture of the of Vatican. You you remember you take a look at that picture that is uh, that is there in the in, in the box. That is that is the way that is Saint Peter's Basilica. That is the way it's uh, it's during the Second Vatican Council. Unfortunately, you're not able to see uh, that picture at the very last pillar here, the very first pillar that you will find. You will find there. There's an image there. I forgot now who that is, but the pillar before that is the pillar where St. Vincent, the statue of St. Vincent uh, stands. There's a pillar, it's a, it's a second pillar actually, as you go, as you enter St. Peter's Basilica, on the right side, there are several pillars. And these are the pillars of the church, big saints like Benedict, like Francis, like Dominic, like Ignatius, and St. Vincent de Paul is one of the pillars. The second, the second pillar, you have the statue of St. Vincent. And it's the statue of St. Vincent in the, form of the, you know, he has a cross and he's preaching and he is uh, Bernini. That's the Bernini's uh, statue of St. Vincent. Uh, it's a beautiful, unfortunately, we're not able to, to show it. Maybe I should show it uh, next uh, next time. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful picture of, uh, of St. Peter's Basilica. But if you, if you notice, look at the decoration on St. Peter's Basilica. It reminds you of a very ornate kind of, uh, of a church because it was decorated during the time of the Romantic period of the, uh, the church from the 1500s all the way to our own time. So it's very elaborate. If you are there, you're really, oh my God, we spent so much money on this. Okay. Well, that's the Basilica of the church. Okay, I'm going to talk about the three the document on Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution on Sacred Liturgy, the Constitution of the Church, Lumen Gentium, and the Constitution of the Church in the Modern World. Just kind of a, a review. What is the church that we find in Sacrosanctum Concilium? As you will find, as you probably have, heard, have uh, studied, Sacrosanctum Concilium was the first constitution that was approved by the Second Vatican Council. It was the best prepared the most uh, widely pre prepared constitution, uh, of, uh, what do you call this, uh, presented to the, the Second Vatican Council bishops. And it got an approval that was really out outstanding. By the end of the first session, practically that was all approved. Not yet officially approved, but the following year it was approved. In 1963, it was approved officially. But actually all the discussion had already finished by the time, the end of the first, uh, first uh, session, 1962. <clears throat> and I, I can tell you honestly that much of it is credited to a confer, a Vincentian confer, who uh, worked as the secretary general of the implementation of the Second Vatican Council, Father Bugnini. Of course, he became Archbishop Bugnini. Uh, but uh, all the liturgical scholars will tell you that he was instrumental in shaping the constitution and sacred liturgy. So something that is close to home. Father, uh, Father Pura, Raul Pura, uh, did his uh, dissertation on Bugnini, on, on the work of the contribution of Bugnini to liturgical reform. Anyway, <clears throat> the Sacrosanctum Concilium would speak, of course, about the liturgy about the cultic celebration, but it is not simply a reiteration of what Trent, the Council of Trent said. It was much, much more than that because it was from a salvation historical perspective. It was much broader than simply, it is the, the act that, is, that the ordained minister does on behalf of the church. No, understanding the liturgy from the bigger context first salvation history, and of course, the role that Christ plays. That's why it has a Christological framework, but also the church as being in communion with Christ. So in other words, you talk about the liturgy, but from a, starting with a much broader perspective, salvation history, 
and then narrow it down to the coming of Christ in the incarnation. And then, of course, now continuing process that is being lived and experienced by the church. You're still not talking about the, the, the liturgy itself, but now who is celebrating? It's the church that is celebrating. And why is the church celebrating it? Because it is the body of Christ. Because the church is in communion with Christ. So a very, very wide Trinitarian framework, Christological framework, but also the role of the Spirit. But the very important thing is the recovery of the sense of community. You talk about full and active participation. This was the council that cemented this idea of the full active participation as a principle, in fact, the number one principle, because precisely everybody has to participate in this celebration because it is our celebration as a church. We are all members of the church. It's not just the priest. The priest has a role to play because he's the leader, he's a presider, but it is our celebration. So the whole idea that it is our community that is celebrating, not just because the priest allows us or the bishop allows us to participate. No, we have the right to participate in it. Why? Because it is our celebration. It is how we become a church. It is in the liturgy where we, come, we can truly say we are the church. It is in the communion that exists between us that we become truly the church. So, but of course, the liturgy does not exhaust the entire activity of the church. We have many other things, like the pastoral work. This is still part of our work as a, as a church. But it's precisely the liturgy that brings all of those things together, brings them. And this is where we celebrate it. We celebrate it with Christ. We celebrate it with, with others, with people in, 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 uh, in, in this world. And, of course, we celebrate with every people that continue to celebrate this Eucharist in their own locality. So we are in communion with not only among ourselves, but with many other people who are doing the same kind of thing. Okay. So the liturgy... <clears throat> The spiritual life is not confined to participation in the liturgy, but the liturgy is the fons and the culmen. What does what does it mean to say fons? The fountain summit. No, the source. The source. Fountain the source. Culmen is the summit, summit, the apex. Apex. So it is the source of our Christian life. We draw life from that communion. But also all our actions are moving towards that celebration. That's why it's called the fonts and the kulmen, the source and the summit of our Christian life. So this is much, much wider and bigger than the Tridentine concept of liturgy as the act of the ordained ministers. So in a way, the idea of the church as a community, as a communion, is something that is proven well, well beyond uh, the document of the second of the Council of, of, no, of the Constitution on the Second Liturgy, because it is there where we truly become a church. The church becomes truly a church when we are gathered together in around the table of the Lord, and we profess communion, profess our faith on, 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 on Christ, but also we come together as His own body. <clears throat> Now, if you look at the second uh, document, Constitution, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, the way the chapters are arranged, you can already see that, again, Sacrosanctum Concilium had influenced the idea of the Church that we would find in Lumen Gentium. And that is true. Sacrosanctum Concilium, the document on the liturgy, implanted the seed of what it means to be a church. The church is a communion. And so when, they, when Lumen Gentium would speak about the church, they would speak about first the mystery of the church. And the mystery of the church goes back, of course, to the Trinity. It goes back to the Trinity, goes back to the incarnation, to the, to the salvation, and goes back to something that continues on for the last 2,000 years now. This has continued. That is the mystery of the church. And in chapter 2, Lumen Gentium would speak about who belongs to the church or who is considered as part of the church. You notice, it's not just the Roman Catholic Church, but it is the people of God. 
So when you're really talking about the people of God, you're talking about, are the Jews also members of the people of God? In fact, they were the first people of God, so to speak. Okay. But how are we part of the people of God? Because if you draw it from a salvation historical perspective, then you will understand how we are part of that people of God, chosen ones. And now we are the chosen ones today. And we still do not exclude the Jews, but also we do not exclude others who are not yet. We reach out to them. So every person who believe, believes in God can be considered as part of the people of God. So in other words, the concept of church is very on different levels. A very wide level, a very religious level, the part of the, the people who believe in God, but also on a very specific level about the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, we still claim that we are what we call this. We are the, we are we are at the heart of the church. Okay, but now we we cannot just simply say we are the only ones who belong to the church. No, because the church now the meaning of the word church has been um, enlarged. And only then does the church, does the, the document speak about the hierarchical structure of the church. You see, from the sense of community, then, okay, we understand that there has to be organization. We understand that there has to be leaders. There has to be somebody who would make the final decision. That is part of the hierarchical structure of the church. And so we understand that. We understand that there is, there's a place for it in the, in the church. And through, through the years, through the centuries, there has always been uh, what you call this a church that is now <clears throat> uh, led by my leaders. And for this particular kind of leadership, you have to be properly designated or chosen by the community. And that is what happens. Then shortly after that, you talk about the laity. As we said, none of the major documents in the previous 2000 years of uh, conciliar documents in the church spoke about the laity as laity. It's only in Lumen Gentium that we find a whole chapter dedicated to the idea of the laity. Because we are going back to the real meaning of baptism. How by baptism we become members of the church. Therefore, all of us were one, at, well, at least uh, at one time in our life, we were members of what we call the laity. So that is, we give back the dignity that is appropriate uh, to them. At the same time, uh, telling them you have also responsibilities. You have privileges, but you also have response. You have rights, but you also have responsibilities. And then chapter five talks about what is the reason for all of this? We are, of course, we are all gathered together. We are always in communion because we are asked to be the, the light of the world in this, in this world. And how do we become the light of the world? by, of course, imbibing in us the spirit of holiness that has been part of the mission that Christ has entrusted to us. Okay. In particular way, those who are in the religious communities, they show us they are the symbols of, the, uh, <clears throat> of that calling towards holiness. So you have the hierarchical structure, you have the laity, but you also have the religious. And the, basically the religious there are what we would call the charismatic part of the church. The religious is, the, re, the group of religious, the commun religious communities are expressions of the charismatic structure of the church. And there is a place for them in the church. And then of course, chapter seven, we'll talk about eschatological nature of the pilgrim church. We are a pilgrim church, we are moving in the direction towards the end time, eschatology, eschaton. And that is, we are not, in a way, telling us, remember we talk about heaven. Here, we're not talking about heaven, we're talking about the eschaton. So in a way, that kind of spirituality about heaven, you know, uh, Vatican II has already gone beyond the theology of heaven. It's already going towards that time when we come in full communion with Christ himself. We are a pilgrim church, but there will come a time when we will all be united together. That's very, very strong in the Second Vatican Council. And chapter 8, of course, is the role of the Blessed Mother in the mystery of Christ in the church. How 
Mary is the best example and model of what it means to be church. To be one who is faithful to Christ, who is showing in his person the values of Christ, who in a way endures the suffering that Christ himself uh, had endured, but at the same time looking forward to what is coming, the eschaton. The Blessed Mother is that kind of a person. So that is the way Lumen Gentium would speak about the church. Very, very wide perspective now. So very different from what you would find in, in the Middle Ages and even in the, uh, what is this, in the Council of Trent. And of course, in Vatican I. But still, we can speak about the church as an intra. Talking about the church from within or towards the, 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 the group within the church, an intra. In the roots of the church, in the mystery of the Trinity, in salvation history, it's Christological. Christ is the light of all nations. But because we are the body of Christ, we also become, in a way, light for others. What is the extent of the church? People, the Jewish roots, humanity, the groups of believers, and particularity of the Roman Catholic Church. Again, they have to be very careful of the claim, previous claim that the church, you know, the Roman Catholic Church has a right to be considered as, well, when we talk about the, all the signs of the church being present in the Catholic Church, then I said, we can say, yes, we are. The church, we are members of the church. But the church also has a mission. And it's no other than Christ's mission. The third constitution is the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world, known as Gaudium et Spes. Okay. I can show you all the, the different parts here, and you can already see the, what, what the, the church is trying to see. This is now what they call this, the, the church ad extra towards the other. So, for example, you have a preface. You're already talking about a very important uh, matter. The church, the relationship between the church and the whole human family. Okay? We have an obligation towards the whole human family. We're not just for ourselves. <clears throat> we are responsible for what happens in human society. So what does the Constitution do in the first part? talks about the situation of man in the world today. So we're not talking about religious uh, things yet. We're talking about what is in existence, recognizing uh, what other people uh, say about the of humanity, which we all share. So the vocation of man, the dignity of the human person, the community of humankind or mankind, man's activity in the universe, the role of the church in the modern world. So, again, the perspective is all of humanity and then focusing on what is the role of the church in regard to all of this humanity. That's in part one. Part two talks about the very urgent problems. What are those urgent problems? Chapter one, dignity of marriage and the family. And the church has, in a way, has the right to speak about it. Because in a way, we can say it's the guardian of guardian of the, the, the family. Chapter two talks about the proper development of culture. You notice that uh, in the scientific revolution, in the technological revolution, uh, the authority of the development of culture would be the sociologist, the anthropologist, the scientist, but not the church. But in the Gaudium et Spes, the church says, we do have a say on what is the proper way of developing culture. Why? Well, we have centuries to prove it. From the Roman Empire all the way to the Middle Ages, all the way to the Renaissance, and all the way to our own time, the church has always been there and developing culture. In fact, the church has developed the culture in such a way that you know, we can identify many of the things that are happening now as cultural forms that were actually facilitated by the church. And then talks about the economy and social life, what the church has to say about this, the political community and fostering of peace, establishment of the community of nations. Okay. 
So <clears throat> what all in all, what we have here is the new relationship between church and the world. The Christological framework allows the church in the modern world to consider itself as having a mission, not only ad intra, but also ad extra to those outside of its fold. We still keep the distinction between church and society, of course, but they are not necessarily antagonistic with each other, nor is sim simply a relationship of, of power wielders. In other words, who is more powerful, the church or society? It's more like we are in dialogue with one another, and if we were to cooperate with one another, yes, that would be for the good of all. So kind of a service orientation. All right, so what we, what we really have, there are three constitutions that tell us about a very different way of looking at the church. On this, three different ways of looking at the church would depend how we look at ministry. Because how we perceive the church to be is how we will act as ministers of that church. So we will discuss it, of course, in our next uh, session. In the meantime, I'm going to give you these guide questions for your paper. That's a very simple kind of a, a paper from our review of the historical development of ministry. What two aspects or ideas are worth keeping for the future? Remember, we're talking about the next part. We're talking about the re-envisioning ministry in the future. What are the two ideas or aspects that are worth keeping for the future and why? Why do you think? are worth keeping and what two aspects or ideas are worth revising or reformulating altogether and why okay in your answers cite some references from the required class readings to support your assertions i'd like you to make use of the readings that we have in order to to understand or to to make me understand why you consider the two aspects both uh, good ideas as well as the not so good ideas that need to be revised, okay? At least five pages, maximum seven pages. US letter size, 12 font, 1.5 space. Is it 1.5 or 1.15? I think it's 1.5, don't? It's due April 5, which is Easter Monday. So you have about two weeks to write the paper. <clears throat> Remember, there are many of you. There are many of you. And I have to correct all of these papers. There are 40 of you. You have to correct 40 papers, my God. 40 times seven. How many pages is that? Too many. Okay. All right. Did you copy already the guide questions? You better copy. Make sure that you... Yes, Father. You get it. Okay. All right, this is where I end uh, for today um, Father. Uh, with, with the uh, 